so it is an astonishing, really embarrassing, humbling fact that almost a hundred years after the Constitution gave African Americans the right to vote, African Americans still didn't have the right to vote. You remember the history, the outlines at least, I'm sure, there was this thing called the Civil War. In the middle of the Civil War, there was a classic bait and switch by this man. Bait and switch when he redefined the war. Up to this point, the war had been a war about saving the Union. Lincoln said it was a war about saving the Union. Indeed, so clearly was it a war about saving the Union that the first 13th Amendment proposed that Lincoln signaled he would support was one that guaranteed slavery would be permanent in the Union just to settle the fight with the South. But at Gettysburg, all this changed. Lincoln declared the war to be a war about a nation dedicated to a proposition not the proposition that the union was inviolable, but that all men are created equal. Now, those words, of course, aren't in the Constitution. Jefferson had penned them for the Declaration of Independence, but now 286,000 casualties into the war, those words were revived, and the war became a war about equality too and about the equal dignity of the ideal of citizenship. And seven years after that remix, America did something that literally no one imagined was possible in 1863 when Lincoln uttered those words. It passed in its constitution an amendment that extended to African American males the right to vote. And when they passed that amendment, the image that was in the minds of those who supported it was something like this. But of course, the future was more like this. It was a future not of equality. Indeed, for 100 years, okay, I exaggerate, for 95 years, there was a concerted effort to exclude African Americans from equal participation in this democracy. Many techniques, the grandest from Texas, because of its size perhaps, I don't know, the all-white primary, a legal device which explicitly said African Americans were not permitted to vote in the Democratic primary. So this became the picture of democracy in the South. There were basically two elections. There was a general election in which all citizens got to vote, and then there were white primaries where only whites got to vote. And you had to win in the white primary to have any effective chance to compete in the general election. Now, of course, blacks were not totally excluded. We could remix the Supreme Court's opinion in Citizens United a little bit to say the people, including blacks, had the ultimate influence over elected officials because, after all, there was a general election but only after the whites had had their way with the candidates who wished to run in that general election. So the African Americans were excluded where it mattered. Boss Tweed used to say, I don't care who does the electin' as long as I get to do the nominating." That was their plan, to do the nominating. And the consequence, of course, obviously, was that we had a democracy responsive to whites only. Now, as we think about that, as we think about how that happened, how that happened for a hundred years, I hope we think, how the hell could they have thought like this? I don't mean the racist, and maybe you want to say in some sense everybody was racist, okay, fine, but how did the relatively decent sorts think like this? How could they believe that the color of one's skin was the metric of citizenship? Okay, it's easy to pick on our parents or grandparents or better people we didn't know. It's easy to point to their blindness, but what I love to do is to think about our blindnesses. 
the blindness that we have. If we look back at our parents and we say of what they did, really? Really? You did that? What are the things our kids are going to look back at us and say, seriously? <laughs> seriously? You thought that? Because there will be those things. There will be those things. They will look at us and say, I can't believe you did that. And one of those things, I think, is how we run elections in America. Once again. Because, of course, it's taken for granted. We can't even imagine it to be otherwise. It's taken for granted that campaigns in America are privately funded. And the consequence of the evolution of this system is that we live in a world right now, in a democracy, quote unquote, right now, where members of Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money get to, to get back to Congress or to get their party back into power. That needs to be updated a bit. This memo from a Georgia campaign says that the candidate has to spend 80% of her time raising money until October when she's allowed to spend only 50% while she goes out and tries to persuade people to vote for her. All of this time dialing for dollars. Of course, not really dialing anymore, pecking for dollars. But that evokes, I think, the model we should embrace here, which is B.F. Skinner's conception of the Skinner box. Remember this box where he showed any dumb animal could learn which buttons it had to push to get the sustenance it needed to survive? This is the picture of the modern American congressperson. <laughs> As he or she learns which buttons to push so that he or she may survive. As they do this, they all develop a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do will affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shapeshifters as they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money. Not an issue 1 to 10, but in issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes how when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. Then to clarify, he went on, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> So we have built a Congress dependent, dependent on their funders. So who are they, these funders? Well, the first thing to convince you of is something you already believe, you just don't know it. It matters who they are. Obviously, it matters. If the Chinese government came to us and said, look, we'll pay for your campaigns and we won't give everybody the equal amount, but they just come talk to us and we'll give them the money they need for their campaigns, you would not be happy with that idea. Or the UAW, or ExxonMobil, or just whites. The point is, it matters who funds their campaigns. So who they are is a question we need to think about. Who are they? Well, if we think about the relevant funders of campaigns in America today, the people who give money at the level that it makes it so that worth at that time of the candidates to think about them, they are no more than 0.05% of the American public. At most, 150,000 Americans are the relevant funders of campaigns which the internet tells me, so it must be true, is the same number of people as are named Lester, which is why in my TED talk I called America Lesterland. And after the Supreme Court's decision in McCutcheon this year, there will be no more than about 35,000 relevant funders of campaign, which turns out to be the same number of people as are named Sheldon. So whether it's Lester Land or Sheldon City, the point is we've evolved a democracy where our government is dependent on the few, not on the many. There's a word for this. It is corruption. It is a corruption of our government, and the nature of that corruption should be familiar to you now, because we have evolved in America once again to elections. Once again, two elections. One election we should call the voting election, in which everyone gets to vote, all citizens get to vote if you're over 18, in some states if you have an ID. And then we have... <laughs> And then we have the green primary, in which the funders get to vote, the 0.05% of relevant funders who get to vote. Now, to run in the voting election successfully, candidates believe they must do extremely well in the green primary. They don't necessarily have to win, there's Jerry Brown, but the point is most of them think <laughs> they have to do extremely well in order to succeed. We've created two elections again, 
and once again, citizens are excluded. But not the 15% of African Americans who lived in the South when there were white primaries, the 99.95% of us who are blocked from participating in this critical stage of selecting those who will govern in Congress. Now, again, I'm not totally excluded. The Supreme Court was right. The people have the ultimate influence over the elected officials because there is a voting election but only after the funders have had their way with the candidates who wish to run in the voting election. So they are excluded where it matters in the process of nominating. And what's the consequence of this? We have a democracy responsive to the funders and maybe only to the funders. Don't tell my dean this. I want to cite some Princeton research here. I'm going to put that away really quickly here, uh, by Martin Guilens and Ben Page. An incredible paper that came out this year, which is the largest empirical study of policy decisions by our government in the history of political science. And what they found was when the preferences of economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled for, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy. This they call a democracy. The average voter has no effect on the government's decision. Now, my hope, my belief, my absolute conviction is our kids are going to look back at us and say, how could we have thought like this? How could we have thought to allow the democracy to become this? Not the plutocrats among us, there are a couple, I get it, but how did the relatively decent souls among us think like this? How did we come to believe that the thickness of one's wallet is the metric of citizenship? And when you think about it like this, we need a little bit of outrage. And who's better than that than John Boehner here? What the hell is this a joke? What the hell is this a joke? What the hell is this a joke? Is this a joke? No, it's not a joke. It's not a joke. It is a tragedy that this democracy, which we rightly look back on as the greatest contribution that America has made to the history and evolution of America, this democracy has come to this. If we were an aristocracy, of course, money would be relevant. If we were a plutocracy, money would be relevant. If we were a kleptocracy, money would be relevant. But we are a democracy, a representative democracy, a republic. And in that device, money is not relevant to citizenship. That's what we were promised. Madison in Federalist 52 said we would be given a government that would be dependent on the people alone the people, by which he explained in Federalist 57 would be, quote, not the rich more than the poor. Not the rich more than the poor. That promise has been broken. That has been broken in our tradition. Now, I've committed a fundamental sin here tonight. The cabal of those of us trying to organize to change the system has gotten together and said, we should talk about this issue in a particular way. And the way we should talk about it is to get people to think in their head, what does this corruption cost you? So you step back and you look at all the issues you might care about. It might be health care reform on the left or government bailouts on the right or global warming on the left or tax system on the right or financial reform on the left and financial reform on the right. What this way of thinking about the problem says, you need to think to yourself, you need to recognize, you're not going to get any of this reform until we reform this corruption. You need to think about what you could get if we fixed this problem. But we're supposed to be changing the narrative here tonight. And I want to change the narrative a bit. This is an important question. You should think about it, because you're not going to get anything until we change this democracy. But it's not just what you could get. It's what we all have lost. We live in this place called Lesterland. It's a bad place for democracy. You won't get what you want. But it's not just bad. It's also wrong. It's not as violently wrong as the wrong suffered by African Americans in our past, but it is as morally wrong. Because it denies 
a fundamental principle of what a democracy is, equal citizenship, equal dignity, equality. Now those are the terms in which I think we need to fight this battle. We can talk about the numbers of people who support this cause and they are very high. More than 96% of Americans believe it important to reduce the influence of money in politics. We can muster proofs about how the reforms all of us care about will not happen until we change the system of funding elections. Hell, we even have a super PAC now designed to rally people to end the system of super PACs. We've got all of this, but none of this will be enough. None of it will be enough on its own until we find the moral reason why this has to be our cause. And to do this, we need to learn, we need to be inspired by, we need to understand the simple dignity of a people who stood up to an obtuse majority and said, I am what Jefferson promised, created equal, and I deserve the justice of equal citizenship. And so too do we all. Because if a minority of America oppressed for hundreds of years, could find the courage to stand up and demand equality in a political system, then so too should a supermajority, not the 99%, the 99.95% of us, so too should we have the capacity to stand up and demand the equality this system promised us. This is the moral question of our time. This is the moral question of our time. Can we reclaim this democracy? My view is we can. My life is committed to the ideal that we will, but what I know is that it will only happen if you step up if you stand up, if you demand it the way it has been demanded at every point in our history, when the power of equal governance was extended to citizens, we are the citizens. It is our government. It has been taken from us. You need to stand up and grab it back. Thank you very much.